Good morning, church. It's that time. You've waited for the past year of 2020 so far for today. Now, some of you had said, I've, I've, that was three weeks ago, Pastor. Yes, it was, I know. But it's exciting because we're here today because we want to burn the ships of our past. And, and I am so excited because I didn't even bring the fire department. And I know Dell, uh, I watched Dell over there and he's like this and, you know, and, uh, and he was praying a little bit there too. Lord, why did we say yes? No. He didn't really say yes, did you? <laughs> I've learned that a lot of times when you want to see something done right yourself, you get the person who knows how to do it. It's not me. But that's why I want to say thank you. You know, uh, we know that the SS Minnow sunk, right? We all know that from, uh, dun, 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 dun. yes, Gilligan's Island. But, but we know that the, the, the Jason and Maria, is that what they call this ship? <laughs> the Jason and Maria, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, you know, but, but this ship they had put together and, and, and God bless their heart, they did, didn't they do a great job on the ship? You have to understand something, this is a tiny ship. Because I said to Maria, I said, oh man, I just have this vision, we're gonna burn a ship, it's gonna be amazing. And she said, oh, that's so exciting. And then so when she came in, she said, you should see this thing. It, it probably reaches the lights. And I said, huh, what? We have to burn it. <laughs> okay. I said, what are we, where are we going to put it? <laughs> she, I said, can you do just a little smaller? <laughs> you mean like this? I said, a little smaller. A <laughs> little smaller. So there's the ship. Yeah, it's good stuff. <laughs> we put an announcement out yesterday. Uh, Riley... It was my filmmaker yesterday. And in less than 24 hours, over 700 people had viewed that announcement about today. Mainly the fire departments. <laughs> I've been contacted by several of them. But I said, whatever brings you to the Lord, you know what, come on up. Try and put the flame of the Holy Spirit out. Good luck with that one. You say that now until the parking lot's on fire. <laughs> But she, she helped me do that, and, and, you know, it was really cool because there was, there, I didn't really burn my shed down. If you didn't see it on the internet, I didn't burn my shed down, but it did look like uh, I was going to, but I wasn't. But, but we believe that. We believe that God wants to do something amazing, and we have to understand this ship represents something else in our life. It really does. And, and as cute as it is and all the things that we do around it, we have to understand there's a sense of seriousness in our life and in our walk with God. And I think so many times we become disconnected from God because we struggle with things in our life. And the enemy has a way of pushing us away from what we're really called to do. And what I've come to understand is that the church is really, a, if, you, if you could put it in terms of something else, and, and I know some people aren't in here aren't football people, but if you were, you, if you could imagine all the players from both sides running out on the field and just hitting into each other, knocking each other over. And you'd say, well, what purpose is that? It doesn't, I mean, who won the game? Who didn't win the game? What game was there? When did it start? When did it end? What I'm telling you is that the church is in, in that same concept. We can be disorganized because we don't know what our call is. And we have to have a map and some organization to determine what way we're moving. And that's what we're talking about going into 2020, developing teams of people that can minister effectively together to reach the most amount of people possible. Listen, I gotta tell you, for those that you invited visitors and for visitors that came in today, we are so glad you're with us today. God bless you, thank you. We've said it before, we're gonna say it again. We are so glad that you're with us. We wanna encourage you. We want you to call this place home. We want a, a starting base for you to go ahead and serve uh, in any capacity, because God has placed a special purpose on you, and we understand that. So I want to encourage you as we press through this series, we want to know what God wants to do with us in 2020. We want to know how to serve him in the way that we're going to do that, and so we're going to have to continue to dig deeper in order to do that, because God's not asking for any surface Christians. He's not, and, and the reality is because the problem is when the waves of life come, we get knocked over too easily. And we end up finding ourselves blaming God. How many times have you been in position crying out to God saying, this is your fault. 
that I'm in this position. God wants deep rootedness to where we can look at something and say, God, I don't understand your ways, and I know that, but it's going to be okay as long as you're in control, and I don't forget that you're in charge, amen? Amen. God wants to do that in our lives, and we're encouraged each week to do that, and uh, I I talked about this series, and today ends this series, and and, uh, we talked about the vision for New Stanton Assembly, God, and, and what it would look like if God was able to get a hold of every person in this place to use them for what they were called for. Could you imagine a church operating on that principle that it would be able to use? I've heard things. People have told me, tell me if you haven't heard this. I don't like to serve God because the enemy throws every attack against me when I do. Don't we know that's a great indicator that we're doing something right, not wrong, right? And we need to understand that we need to recognize those things in our life. And, and so he wants to use us in different capacities. And some would say, well, I don't, I have no talent, That's me. (laughs) And that's the beauty of it. That's what makes God who he is. Because if he can take me without talent and use me, he can do it with any of us, including myself. He wants to use your unique, specific things that you went through in your life to reach others that are going through theirs. At 7.7 billion people on the planet, trust me, somebody's going through what you've went through. And, and, and even Paul talks about that, that we're able to use these things uh, so we can reach others. We talked about this vision for the church and how, what it was going to look like. We also talked into the second week where Paul was uh, talking to the church of Philippi, and he said in verse 10 in, in Philippians, he says, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. The truth of the matter is that everything that we do in this life is going to go by the wayside. The Bible says that one day, God bless you, the Bible, I had to say that was my wife. The Bible says that one day, one day that our works will be tested by fire. He says that, that it says that our, our, our works will be tested by fire. And those that remain through the fire will be for our reward and those that aren't will be burned up. So we have to ask ourselves, what are we doing for God? And what are we doing that he's called us to do? For me, I look at it, you know, they did this article thing on Pastor Dave, which I think was really cool, and uh, the the Assemblies of God, and I think I've mentioned this, have found out that this church is the only church (laughs) so far in the country that uh, that I'm aware of that uh, two non-pastors have become pastors (laughs) and lead a church, and their title underneath it was, what has gone wrong with the church? No, I'm kidding. (laughs) Who's in charge that did this? (laughs) But that's the cool thing because in those articles that were written, it says, look at the power of God that can take and transform lives and and put people into service because God has called them and now continue to challenge and call people every single day. We see that and we know that God, uh, that he wants to do that work and that's what uh, Paul was talking about, that he wanted to experience the power of Christ being raised from the dead. He said he wants to suffer with him, sharing in his death. A lot of times we talked about we don't want to suffer. We don't necessarily want anybody like suffering. I'm not a real good sufferer. I'm a guy. I know most of you knows. But I said, ladies, they're just, you're just different. Huh? Do tell? Oh, I thought you said do tell. Ladies go in, going to have a baby come out. Look at this baby. It's awesome. Guys run out. <laughs> and it ain't now. It hurts. Hurts bad. You know what I mean? Uh, maybe our tolerance. And some guys, you guys are Marines. You guys are you know, Marine style. Even if you weren't in the Marines, you're tougher than I am and everything. Uh, i one of those that hit my hand with the hammer on the nail. Is there air conditioning in the house? I need to lay down. <laughs> and my daughter one time, she said, Dad, are you bleeding? I'm like, no, I am laying down. I'm done. <laughs> we want to suffer. Do we want to suffer with Christ to share in his glory of his resurrection? He wants to experience the power of the resurrection from the dead. I pray that's our prayer today, that we are seeking Christ in such a powerful way that we would experience with him in the resurrection of the dead. He went on to say that the one thing that he does in life is press forward and forgetting what's behind him. The past has been such an ability to hold on to us. The enemy has been able to challenge us to hold on to our past to keep us ineffective. 
And the truth of the matter is the enemy understands that, but the enemy doesn't control that. We allow the enemy to defeat us sometimes because we've got to come back to God and say, I need the power to move forward. We mentioned this in this, in this uh, the slide that we have that you can't reach your goals if you're chained to your past or you're always looking in the rearview mirror. It's tough to move forward when you're concentrated and focused on the past. And some of you might sit in here today and say that I know that I have a conversation and I'll pick up something that happened to me 20 years ago. I'll say, well, if they just would have done something different, I'd be a different person today. I'm here to submit this to you that maybe God wants to do something different, not to them, but to you first. And that's not an easy place to be. But maybe in order for them to change, we've got to take the first step. And we have to say, God, today I need to challenge you in helping me to take that first step. And this is what it looks like to you. Last week when we came together in worship, we seen the power of the Holy Spirit working at lives in people right around the altar. We seen the Holy Spirit poured out on somebody in the very front of this service yesterday. I've asked the question, we've talked about it, when's the last time we've seen the Holy Spirit poured out? in a Pentecostal church on a Sunday morning. Praise God, it ought to be something we see every single day. We shouldn't have to wait for a special service to invite God to come and fill us. If he wants to move, we need to be able to move with him. So I challenge you in your thinking going forward that our worship services are gonna start to look a little bit different and that we're gonna start to allow the Holy Spirit in these services to do what he wants to do. Because it's not about what we lead and what we do, although we need that leadership and we need that structure, but we need God. To, we need God more than anything. Amen? Amen. Praise God. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. We know that in Acts chapter 2 talks about the evidence in speaking in tongues. Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 10, and Acts chapter 19 are three examples of where the Holy Spirit's poured out on people. And they, the evidence was by speaking in tongues. You see, when we come to the altar, we don't seek to speak in tongues. That's not the plan. The plan is to seek Jesus and allow him to fill us. He's the baptizer. And that's what we call out to. We cry out to him. God has promised the Holy Spirit for all believers. And we know that we receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit to empower all believers to share the gospel message of Jesus Christ. The good news of the gospel. We remember and we talk about Peter in the courtyard as he cowered behind barrels prior to being the Holy Spirit poured out on him. And then after that happens, he stands up in front of the Sanhedrin and he gives a message that it just, the Bible says that it cut people right there. It cut them and separated the joint and the marrow and it cut them and separated them at their heart. And it penetrated their heart because the Holy Spirit was speaking through him. And he didn't care at that point who killed him. It didn't matter. Because guess, listen to this. This is a really cool part. You can't kill the Spirit. The Spirit's going to live forever and you cannot kill. So that's what Jesus talks about. It doesn't matter what you do to my body. It doesn't matter what you do to my body because my Spirit will live forever. And what you trade in this lifetime for what you're giving it up, for what you're going to receive, is far superior and outweighs everything you'll go through. That's how we can take this saying when it says, uh, in, in the word where it says that if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. You don't need it. Because in this lifetime, uh, an eternity spent with Jesus Christ compared to an eternity spent in hell is the difference. That we can do that and we can say, I don't need it anymore because God promises you a new body. Amen? I don't know about you, but how many wants a new body? I know. I know. How many don't want to go to the gym to get one either? <laughs> I can tell this is the church I love. But we've seen Peter doing this. We've seen that. Listen, when he he made this, we we talked about last week after he's filled and everything, but we went back before that a little bit where he was talking with Jesus, and Jesus was bringing them all to a point of decision, and he says, who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? He was making uh, Peter and the disciples make a conscious decision to follow him or not. I think far too many times, We've watered down the message. We've watered down what it means to be a follower of Christ. And that's what I'm going to challenge you right at the heart and the core of today's message before we burn what's behind us. Because here's the reality. When he asked Peter that, Peter says, you're the Messiah, right? You're the one that we looked for for ages. He understood it. He got it. He got a hold of it. And, and Jesus said to him, you know, and I'll talk about that in a second. But he went on to say something beyond you're just the Messiah, 
He said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. He didn't have to say that. He could have said, you're the Messiah. But when he expressed those words, Jesus said, blessed are you, Simon Peter, because these aren't revealed to you other than by God. It wasn't by flesh, but spirit revealed it to you. So in other words, he got it. And I believe that's the difference of what works in our life, what keeps us out of the world, if you will, but let us live in the world. That's the difference. When we understand and God reveals to us that his spirit to you, we can uh, determine how to live in a world and not be entangled in the world. Because I believe sometimes we can be weak. If any of you are like me, we can, you can be weak. You can be wore down. You don't get proper sleep. Anybody understand what I'm talking about? Some people are asking, sleep, what was that? I, don't, I struggle with insomnia. How many struggle with insomnia? Yeah, it's, uh, it's more relevant and more prevalent than you know. And you struggle and you say, I do everything in my power that I know to get back to sleep, but it just doesn't work that way. We struggle with these things. And I believe this, when we are weak and we're and physically down, listen, what did the enemy do to Jesus? When he took him out there into the wilderness for 40 days, he didn't eat. He was down. He was he just on, he just pulled down, drained down, and the enemy starts to bring the attack. Should that not be a map for us? Shouldn't we see that to see that's what the enemy wants to do? So we have to do our very best to try to discipline, which is one of the fruits of the Spirit, discipline our bodies and ourself on how to correct and what to do with our own lives that would enable us to do that. But Peter, uh, he declared that, and he made this declaration to Christ. He said that, that you are the son, the, uh, the, the son of the, uh, you, I'm sorry, you're Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. And he, he, he made that declaration, but it was one of these things where that statement that he made would demand a commitment of his life. The question in here today as I asked last week, when you make that statement, our message today is called count the cost. Are you willing to say today that when I said, Jesus, you are son of the living God, that I'm willing to give up everything I know is this life to follow you? At this point, we're going to talk about this in the scripture, what we see going on. And, and I don't want to share that with you just for a second here. I will be sharing that with you. But as we come to the end of this message in this series today, it's not right now, just so you know. <laughs> but God had laid on my heart over a month ago that, uh, that we have to follow right behind this. The question that we have coming up is that we have to ask ourselves this question, what is the cost to follow Jesus Christ? I had to make a determination in my life, my own personal life, at what point am I done playing life? Well, Pastor Ron, you don't understand. If I, if I go ahead and make that commitment to Christ, he might call me to missions. I might have to go clear to another country. Can I tell you something? That if God calls you to do that, he will not only enable it, but it'll be the most fulfilling thing you've ever done in your life. You will never look back and say, oh, I can't believe I did. You will be acting and walking and living in the spirit of God when you live according to his will and his purpose for you and you're right in the middle of the road. Listen, there's a big road out there with two yellow lines that go down it and we can be all over that highway on one side or the other. We can be off the side of the road. Well, I'm not gonna do it, Pastor Dave, but we can, we can be trying to walk in the world, trying to walk on this side of holiness we can do all that, but God says, listen, you want to live a life that's fulfilling, move on over into the center of my will. Get right in the center and go right down the road because that's what I'm calling you to, right in the center. That's where he wants you to come, and we're going to see this. We're going to talk about this right now for a few minutes. In Luke chapter 14, uh, verses 30, I'm sorry, 25 to 33, I'm going to read with you here. Uh, again, it's Luke chapter 14. It's called Counting the Cost. And it just simply says this. It says in verse 25, a large crowd was following Jesus. He turned around and said to them, if you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else. Your father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. And if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. 
But don't begin until you count the cost in verse 28. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there is enough money to finish it? Otherwise, you might complete only the foundation before running out of money, and then everyone would laugh at you. They would say, there's the person who started that building and couldn't afford to finish it. Or what king would go to war against another king without first sitting down with his counselors to discuss with his army of 10,000 could defeat the 20,000 soldiers marching against him? And if he can't, he will send a delegation to discuss terms of peace while the enemy is still far away. Verse 33, so you cannot become my disciple without giving up everything that you own. Would you bow and pray with me? Lord God, your word is spoken today, and I pray, Lord, that your word would be the word that you have for each person in here today. I pray as I've prayed before, God, that I wouldn't stand in the way of what your spirit wants to do, that you would enable me and empower your servant to preach boldly the gospel message that you want to proclaim. But not only that you would do that, God, but you would penetrate hearts. You would break the will of people that need their will broken today, God. You'd restore hope for those who need restored. And God, you would lift up and challenge people and encourage them to become true followers of you in every capacity that you would bless them, God, that they would seek your will for their life. For we give it to you this morning, and we praise you in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. As we follow through this journey, and we've been talking about following Jesus in 2020, we see that Jesus had picked up some followers along the way. Some people had met him and thought, this, this, this prophet that speaks is different than most people. And we see where uh, he's, he's doing these teachings and he's doing different things. The Bible talks about that when he was 12 years old, he was speaking in the temples and working with people in there and learning and, and also probably teaching some of these uh, adults that, were, that knew the word of God. And we see that as Jesus starts into this ministry, that after his baptism, he starts into this ministry, but people are starting to follow him because they're saying, I'm seeing some things going on. There's a buzz about this guy who's coming through. A lot of times we, we put a, a dampener on people and say, well, don't just come for the show. You know, we really want the heart and the root, but that's God's job to do. We want to invite all people to Christ and let them decide for themselves. Amen? It's our job just to invite and to encourage people. So we see this happening. We see these people coming and, and, and here Jesus feeds 5,000 when there's nothing to give them. So the disciples, and when I use the word disciples, but I mean followers, start to see this naturally. Some are coming along for a free minner. A uh, minner. Minner. I got thinking about that minnow ship. I don't know why. <laughs> Isn't that funny how God just, just certain things. I mean, I blame it on God, but it's probably my own problem. But they were coming for a free meal, amen? We know people do that in life. We know people are just going to follow God for what I can get out of it, that kind of thing. But Jesus was saying there's going to come a point in time things are going to get real serious because he knew that he was on the road to the crucifixion. He understood that. And so he's challenging the disciples to come a little bit higher, step higher up onto higher ground because the waves are going to get a lot crazier and you're going to get taken under if you stay down there. And he sees that, so he's pulling them. But in the, in the meantime, he's narrowing down the field of people that are going to continue to follow him. I've often wondered where I would be in that day. Be sitting at home eating a meal saying, hey, there's a guy who says he's Jesus, the Messiah. Let's go see what he's, what he's all about. Let's go find out. And how if I would have been one that would have turned away at that time, and would I have been one that was standing at the cross when all that took, went down, watching them come through the streets? I don't know. It's a powerful place to put yourself in. But I believe today we also do that. We, we, we come and we, well, I'm not certain. I don't want to join a church, be an organization. I don't want to, I don't know what they're going to make you do. But Jesus is saying, come, follow me. Don't worry about what anybody else thinks. I've heard people say to me, I don't want to go to the altar, Pastor. Can I tell you why? And I said, yeah, tell me why. And they said, and this has been said to me. It's not one time. It's been said to me many times. I feel like people are looking at me and judging me. 
I feel like they know what my life is, so naturally, of course, you need to go up there. There's so-and-so. Can I tell you something? That most people that have entered into this house are praying for you at that time. That God gets a hold of your heart and that he moves in your life because they want to see what God wants to do. And I, I believe this with all my heart. When there's invitations like that, don't hesitate. Run. You only have an audience of one, and that's Jesus. That's your audience. It's nobody else. Because anybody's going to come up to you. If they're going to put a hand, it's not condemnation. It's like, thank God, brother. I'm so proud of you today. Thank God, sister, that he got a hold of you today. Man, I'm praying for you. Did, did you know I sat in my chair and prayed for you for months that God would minister in your life? Did you know that? And so many times we don't see that. So I just, I thank God for what he does. But what would it have looked like then? We realized that these people were following, but the gate was going to start to get a little bit more narrow. And there was going to have to be a point of decision that was going to have to be made. And I believe this with all my heart in the church right here, Newstand, there's going to have to be a decision. Do I want to follow or do I want to be left behind? And that's a challenge for each of us to take into our heart. And when I say left behind, please understand what I mean. I mean that God is on the move. And I want to be a part of what God's doing. Amen? And I want to encourage you to be a part of it too because it's rewarding. It's rewarding what God does. Even in the pain, it's rewarding what he does. And we see that in this first part of the chapter. We see that Jesus goes to a Pharisee's house. He's teaching about the Sabbath and so forth. And he's talking about all that. And we know that the Pharisees at that time were studies. They did study with the law and so forth. The religious law, if you will. And, and a lot of times they would set themselves up here. And kind of judge you a little bit. Be a little judgy. You ever met somebody a little judgy? I have. I <laughs> have. They're like, they're like, hey, 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 what did I do? Everything. <laughs> okay. All right. I'll do it better, you know? But we, we, can, we can be like that. Self-righteousness will do that to us sometimes. But I'm praying that God would touch that and use that to his glory in one way or another. Because even the Pharisees were used to bring people to Jesus. We may not see that all the time, but it's truth. Now, it's for them to deal with God specifically, not us. So these Pharisees were in there, and, and Jesus came in. There was a sick man. He said, basically, in a sense, what would you do if it was your kid? Would you heal him or wouldn't you? I have to believe a lot of people, when Jesus was in a conversation with, stood there and didn't know what to say. A lot of times it said they, would, they were speechless. They would just stand, and they couldn't say anything else because he knew what they were thinking. <laughs> he knew what they were going to say, and he knew what the answer was. But he went on to talk later about the humility in people's lives and how we should put others first in that chapter in 14 right in here. And he goes on to talk about the kingdom of heaven through a parable. And he's talking about how he poured his message out to the Jewish people and said, here is the gift that I've given you. I've died for you and I'm going to give it. But listen, here's the deal. In this great banquet that he talked about, he said, if you don't want it, it's no problem. I'm going to take it to the Gentiles. Thank God that he came to the Gentiles. Amen. Amen. Do you realize today you and I are Gentiles, if you're not of the Jewish descent in that regard, that God wants to do a work in your life he's not done because he wants to graft you into his, uh, his family is what he wants to do. But we see in verse 26, uh, he, Jesus starts to get extreme. Don't we know that's what separates us sometimes? I'm okay with the singing. I'm okay with the lights. But when you start getting extreme, I'm checking out, <laughs> Right? I mean, I, I, like I said, I was in a public high school, and I used to wear my little bow tie, I told you. And they yelled at me, called me a pizza boy, religious freak. I was a Jesus freak. I was a couple other things, too. I'm not sure. Uh, I can't repeat any of those ones. It was a nice, nice son, good fellow. Anyway, but they were, they were uh, doing, uh, they would say different things, but it would be about being extreme. I remember when we uh, opened the young adult ministry years ago, and we, we went into and said, how are we going to reach people? And we were praying about the name of AMPT, and the, the name of AMPT said simply AMPT. It was, it, had, it was an acronym for the letters that said, A Ministry Preparing Everyday Disciples. A ministry preparing every day. That's what the E stood for. We realized not long after that, the name needed to be changed. Somebody had submitted, we should change the name to a ministry preparing extreme disciples. Because in the world we live in today, we've got to be extreme. We've got to go further than we did. Does that mean we go out and we, we belittle people? Absolutely not. 
Does that mean we go out and we put people down and hurt them and do whatever? No, we pray, but we got to be extreme in our actions. And I believe that the Holy Spirit fills us with the power to be extreme in a loving way. I believe it with all my heart. And, and we see that happening. And, and Pastor Dave and Chris, each week uh, at the FLC campus for the young adults, if you're a young adult and you're not attached to that uh, thing, uh, the uh, group that meets down there on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. at the FLC, it's located one mile right off the driveway. <laughs> this is the commercial for Amped. <laughs> you want to connect with them, talk with them, go see. God, it might be calling you there to do something amazing through there. I want to encourage you to be a part of that. But... Uh, also the people that helped down there as well. But we see that Jesus paid an extreme price when he hung on the cross. And here he goes to challenge the followers to do the same exact thing that he did. We see three quick things that happened there. The first thing that we see is a price is going to be paid to follow Jesus. In verses 26 and 27, many times I think that we're really guilty, and we can be guilty of this, of living in a fast food society. We like free. How many knows there's nothing free, right? There's nothing free. If you're old enough to understand, if you're young, you're like, I know there's free stuff coming. It's not coming. I'm just telling you. But I want to say something. You know, when the Bible talks about it being a free gift, we all of a sudden, we say, well, okay, well, it's free. It is free, and it is in that capacity. But there's a cost associated in how we'll follow Christ. We live in a microwave society, like I said, a get-rich-quick society, and if something doesn't happen now, we get upset. Do you ever minister in somebody's life, try to help pray with them? They just don't get it. I've been giving them the Holy Spirit, and they won't change their mind, and they go back and they do the same thing. The Bible says that one waters, right? One plants a seed, and it goes on to say about these different things, but God gets the increase, not us. So we need to allow the Holy Spirit to work in people's life and be there to mentor to them and, and to breathe them. And Jesus made sure everybody knew that this mission was about to get serious. Throughout this, he would teach people how to forgive, how to love people, how to care for them, how to take care of them and nurture for them as he taught the principles of the kingdom of heaven. And we remember a lot of people that were in those crowds at this point were still thinking that Jesus was going to restore power in Rome and become the leader. That's who they figured he was, so they followed him for that reason. And they were curious, but they wanted to be a part of what was going on. But something that's been very hard for me to understand when I started reading scriptures was when I became a parent and when I heard the words, you must hate those you love, including yourself, if you want to be my disciple. Most of you, if you have family in here, and I'm assuming you did or you probably wouldn't be here, whether it's father and mother or children, think about the fact that it's natural for us to love that which we love. And even if we don't get along with them, oh, you don't know my sister. Oh, you don't know my brother. You don't know whatever. The truth is when push comes to shove, right? Anybody else, you can say whatever you want to your sibling. But when somebody else says it to your sibling, that's another story. Don't you dare talk about, but you did, but that's my thing. That's us. It's how we love. <laughs> it's what it looks like. Mention dysfunctional family, that's who we are, right? But somebody comes against it, but when Jesus says, you must hate everything that you love and love everything you hate, it kind of turns your mind upside down, doesn't it? When you hear it like that. And, and, and I believe this with all my heart. He was trying to separate the flock as well as still today he was trying to do that. And the truth is, Jesus, soon after teaching this, would pay the ultimate price, and he demanded all of their allegiance. And today he demands all of our allegiance. He's done the same for us, that he would die an excruciating death on a cross. And he wants you to love him with all your heart. He goes on to say that if they didn't carry their own cross, that they couldn't be his disciple. And you see, at that time, if you told somebody in that area that they had to carry their own cross, if you say that today, what does it sound like? Oh, we tied on our mirror, that little ropey thing, and the cross hangs down, right? We put it up on our sticker on our bumper. We got a cross on our bumper. But whenever he said you got to carry your own cross, they knew that the Romans said, tie a cross on your back and carry it to where we're going to hang you. It ultimately and guaranteed led to death of self. 
We're talking about physical death. I'm encouraging you, I know. (laughs) Pastor Ron, if you encourage like this, please don't ever make us upset. But I'm encouraging you that he's telling you he wants you to go a step further today than you've ever went before. He's saying today's the day you tie yourself to that cross. And we're not going to burn you, just so you know. But he wants you. (laughs) I know some people thought that when I said it. I'm not going to burn you. (laughs) But he wants you to tie everything that you have to that cross and submit yourself to him. Pick up your own cross and carry that. At those days, it was a one-way journey for somebody. Jesus knows there is only one way, and that he is the way. We have to do that. I, I mentioned about this, that we need to dig deeper than we've ever went before in here. We're talking about burning the ships, and this is part of it, letting go of what's behind us. Second thing, very quickly, count the cost to follow Jesus is what I had put in here. And that in my life, uh, I heard that there's, uh, well, we talked about that there's nothing free in there. But we know that there's costs that are involved. There's costs that involved with different things. Uh, how many in here is impulse buyers? Anybody? Impulse buyers? Yeah, it's okay to admit it. Listen, uh, Jim Miller and Ryan right here in the front on Wednesday nights in the back are working with Dave Ramsey. I know it sounds like another commercial, but, but they'll help you with that impulse buying thing. But some of us can be like that. Some of us can go through that. And Jesus wanted us to understand what it meant. He talked about the idea and the, and the idea of building a building and running out. We know that some of us may already know in this area, there was a church that had built this incredible building years ago, incredible building, but did not have a must, enough money to finish that building. And today it still sits empty. And as a reminder that we need to count the cost of what it takes to finish the project. So when you're just saying you come to Jesus, it's not just saying, I'm coming in on a part-time relationship. Look, Jesus doesn't need a part-time friend, a part-time something, anything. He needs you all the time, and he wants you all the time. Last thing, are you willing to give it all to Jesus? Verse 33, it's the idea that I want you to get a hold of if you're willing to give away everything and follow him. The rich young ruler in Mark 10, 21, uh, Jesus said, there's still one thing you haven't done. He told him, go and sell your possessions, give your money to the poor, and you'll have treasures in heaven, then come follow me. And the Bible says that he walked away with his head down. He walked away. When we give our all to Jesus, when Paul said, given his all in Galatians 2.20, when he says, my old self has been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. That's what we're doing when we count the cost and commit our heart to Christ and we do that. The question is, I'm going to invite Lorraine. Wow, you're fast. <laughs> She's like a... <laughs> Lord, you are good. <laughs> I want to invite you today to follow Jesus. In just a couple minutes, we're going to do something different. We are going to set this place on fire outside. Uh, We look at this here today, and I'm going to pray in just a moment. But what I'm going to pray about is this. I'm going to ask you this question. Do you need to commit your heart to Jesus Christ today? I'm going to ask you that question. And I say it ahead of time because I want you to be prepared for what I'm going to ask you. You now know today what it means to give up your life and say, Jesus, I've done it my way all my life and I can't do it any longer. I need you. Don't worry about what your family will think. Listen, your family will be glad that you did that. And you may say, well, they they won't be so happy. There will be a day that God will restore things and do a work through you in in their lives through what he's doing through you in here today. After we pray and we're done praying, I'm going to ask you if there's any of you that are not able to make it out there and would like an usher to come around and to take your little card. Is anybody, let me ask you this first of all. Keep, you can just keep playing the rain. Uh, is anybody, does everybody have a card in their hand that, uh, can you, do you have it if you have it? If you don't have it, put your hand up and they'll give you one for burning your ship that they'll go ahead and run them right around to you real quickly. Just hold your hand up high if you don't have one yet. They'll bring it over to you right where you are. This card was giving this to you today to burn. We're going to have an opportunity to go outside into the corner of the parking lot and burn your ship today. That was the plan. We were going to burn it in here, but we knew it would get excitingly crazy and very hot. Yeah, just keep your hand up. If they haven't given it to you yet, they'll be right around to give you one uh, as well. But if you can't get out there today and you want to give that to an usher after everybody receives one, you can put your hand up and we'll put it in here. 
But I believe that God wants to do a work in here today. I believe with all my heart that he wants to do a work in here today. God has been moving in this place. He's been stirring hearts for a long time. And I have to tell you, just being straight, upright, as, as transparent as I can be, I've sat in church services where I've struggled with fighting with the enemy. Should I commit my heart to Christ? Should I give him all of me? Because after I'm done asking those who want to pray, and all I'm going to ask is by an upraised hand to pray with them. But after I'm done doing that, I'm going to ask you, that if you really plan on today, not only burning your past, but a part of burning your past is counting the cost and committing yourself to Christ in whatever capacity he's called for you this new year, I'm also gonna have you raise your hand that I can pray for you right after this as soon as they're done giving those. If, if you need, there's room on the back if you've got a lot of past to burn. Uh, some of you may have brought in a box with you, whatever the case is. Listen, today maybe you're struggling with some sort of an addiction and God wants you to burn that past of that addiction and put it and get rid of it completely. Maybe you're carrying it onto you today. I was at a church service one time. I watched people come up and threw their cigarettes and pills all over the altar because they were done with what God wanted for them. I believe God's still moving today and that he wants to do that, amen. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Lord, I thank you for what you're about to do in this place, God. As I said before, I'm going to offer this invitation that if you've never received Christ as your Lord and Savior with every head bowed in here today, respecting each other's privacy, if you say today, Pastor Ron, I want to raise my hand, and when I raise my hand, I'm going to look at you, make contact, eye contact with me, that you want to give your heart to Christ because we want to pray and ask Jesus into your heart, and I just want to share that with you. If that's you today, as I'm standing up here, nobody's looking around, would you raise your hand and then make eye contact with me? Pastor Ron, today I need to give my heart to Jesus Christ. It's the first time I need to do that. Yeah, keep your hand up if you do just for a minute. Just make eye contact with me. Yeah, thank you. If there's anybody else, make eye contact with me. And I'm just going to pray with you. That's all I'm going to do. I want to lead you in a prayer today that you can know Jesus is Lord of your life. Is there anyone else? I don't want to leave anybody out. If that's you today, just put a hand up and say, Pastor, please pray with me. Anyone else? Yes, yes, thank you. Thank you. I know God's moving in here. I know God's doing an incredible work in here. Yes, thank you. I see your hand. And when you put your hand up, keep your eye locked on me. Don't worry. Yes. Go ahead and put your hand back down and lock your eyes on me just so I can talk to you. That's all in here. I just want to share this with you in this private moment of your life. If you've raised your hand or maybe you wanted to raise your hand, make eye contact with me now. It's nothing that we can do in ourself. Nothing at all. But it's coming to Jesus and saying, God, I can't do it on my own. I need you to come into my heart to save me. Forgive me of the sin in my life. And I'll pray that prayer with you right now if you want me to pray that prayer with you. You can sit right where you are and we'll just have our eyes locked on together here. And if you want to just pray this prayer, because you don't do any of the work other than admitting to Christ that I can't do it on my own and I need you to save you with his help. Would you do that? And everybody else, if you want to pray this prayer with me as well, you can. Dear Jesus, I know that I have sinned in my life I've done things wrong and I knew they were wrong and I'm so sorry for that. I can't change them, God. But Jesus, today, I trust you as my Lord and Savior. Come into my heart and save me today. I confess what Peter confessed, that Jesus, you are the Son of God and I need you to save me. I'll follow you as best I can with your help all the days of my life for I commit myself to you. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen and amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. I want you to know that God has done something in your life today. And listen, it's not just a prayer, but it's your response to Jesus. He's the one who saves. I don't. Your prayer, your communication with him is why he saves. I want to make sure that if you prayed that prayer, make sure you stop Pastor Dave, myself, one of the deacons, one of uh, the prayer team members, and say, I, I gave my heart to Christ today. I want you to know that. Amen? 
I just want to pray real quickly with our heads down for just another minute. If today you said, Pastor Ron, 2020 is the year God is doing something. I can't deny it. I can't hide it. I can't run away. Put your hand up and say, God, just uh, uh, pray for me this year. I'll pray for you today. And knowing that God wants to do something in your life, but that you agree that today by raising your hand, you fully commit to Christ. And today you're saying, that's me, I'm in. I'm in for whatever he wants for me. Praise God, I'll continue to pray for you as the hands go up all over the place, different areas. If it's you, listen, if it's not you, that's okay. You have to deal with God on this. You, you work with him and ask him. But I pray today in the name of Jesus that you would touch these that have raised their hand, do an amazing work in their life, God. We praise you for it. We thank you for what you're about to do in their life as you prepare and show them uh, to take them places they've never been before, God. As we set sail out of this place today, I just thank you for it. I pray that your work of your Holy Spirit would be manifested in their life and that you would receive power and glory in heaven forever and ever. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. And everyone said, amen, amen. Listen, I want to challenge you as we get ready to leave. Listen, we read the book, uh, the, the Catch the Wind of the Spirit, in a series that we we're doing at the end of the year. If you've not read it, we want to encourage you to be a part of it and to read it. I have to tell you something. We are going out of a man-made vessel we are going to take our oars, right? That's what the Bible said. We're going to take our oars and we're going to throw them into the water. And we're going to be led by the Spirit in this church. And we have to lead the Spirit lead. And the only way we can do it is by throwing our own oars in. Listen, your oars might be heavy and big and have guided for a long time. But you got to let God do the work. Amen? Amen. Listen, if you are not able to go out there and you need your uh, your ship, your little ship put in up here. You want to raise your hand real quick and somebody will come around and get it? Is there anybody at all that needs to, that they can grab it real quick? For everybody else, you are dismissed. We are, we'll go ahead and grab it. And we are headed out to that very far corner and the ship is going to set sail out of here and head over. Uh, be prepared. You'll be handed a match to light your own, your own ship. Let's go ahead and put them right in front, just light yours, drop it down, and then keep moving so everybody can do that. Because remember, when you're done, you're done with whatever it was. All right? All right. Let's pray over this time. God, I just pray that you would do an amazing work out here today. It is cold. We're dying, freezing, but we love you. We know that the power of the Holy Spirit is moving in this moment. So I pray that the things we need to let go of today, God, we'll not only let go, but we're burning. We're not looking back. I thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Listen, you come past Jamie. She will be your striker. There's matches right she here. Everybody grab them. Throw it and run. <laughs> Make it easy. Jamie has a striker. Oh, I was going to say, wait, how? Matches. Matches. We burn them the whole thing. Matches. 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 All right, there you go. Who's first up? Come on, darling. Okay. Get a light. You can get a light. You light it, strike it off, Jamie, light it, and send it. You might want to be a little closer to the ship before you start burning. If yours burns out, don't worry about it. It's going to get all engulfed in a minute here. It's a ceremonial match. Don't get dirty. Put it in, darling. Run with it. Send it in. Listen up. Listen up. We know Jesus only has a plan A, right? And I have a plan B. If this doesn't go the way we planned in about the next seven seconds, everybody needs to take a step back. We're going to add a little Holy Ghost oil and bring it to a fiery demise. All right? There you go. Move on up. If you want to drop it, drop it. Who are you? We may not need this.
Watch out, everyone! Oh, this is so dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, eat. <laughs> totally. Watch out, Be careful. Does anybody have any hot dogs? <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh. Hey. Where's that? That's Gavin. Jesus Christ's name. Everyone said, Amen. 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 Amen.